adjust the agenda uh, a little bit, and we are going to start with Senate File 3616. Senator Mitchell, please, if you would come on down uh, and introduce your bill for us. Thank you so much, Chair, and for adjusting the schedule for um, my other committee that I need to be sitting in. Uh, the Senate file is an opportunity for us to even greatly, or, um, even more greatly engage our students at colleges and enable them in Minnesota to have that right to vote. Um, we have an outstanding voter group in Minnesota. I serve as an election judge, and I'm so proud of all the things that we do in the state to make people have that opportunity to meet them where they are, to be able to um, continue to engage our different electorates. And one of the things that we have heard as we do this is particularly on larger campuses where people might not have the opportunity to have access to transportation, they might be living in the dorms, they might have jobs that don't allow them to get out on election day if that precinct is even close to them that it would be really beneficial for them to have one day of early voting on campus so that they have an extra opportunity. And so what this bill would allow is it would um, allow if the either college administration or the student governing body of a university that had at least 1,500 people, and we went with that number because some of the smaller communities um, might have more commuters, some of them are online campuses, you know, we're not trying to put up pop-up places where it wouldn't be practicable. But if they ask for that, then they can have that one day of early voting, and it wouldn't just be available for them, it would be also available as an opportunity for the staff and local residents that were, had the ability to vote at that site. As some of you may know, when we do early voting, which is technically a form of absentee voting, it's done by the county. So as long as anyone else near that school resided in that county, it would be run like any other early voting site, but just for that one day. So thank you so much for considering this bill to give our college students that better access and ability to engage their voice. We know that when uh, people start voting younger, it tends to be a habit that they carry with them through the rest of their lives. Thank you very much, Senator Mitchell. Uh, we have two testifiers speaking about this bill. Uh, I'd ask you to come to the table, if you would, please. Uh, Mr. Devolitis and Mr. Hornig. Uh, if you would, please, come to the desk. Um, uh, Mr. Devolitis, if you would, please, uh, state your full name for the record, correct my pronunciation, and commence your testimony when you're ready. Hello. My name is Tyra Devilites, and I attend Normandale Community College and am the Vice President of LEDA Men, the statewide organization that represents 100,000 community and technical college students. To start, I'd like to extend my gratitude to Senator Mitchell for championing this legislation and for valuing the input of students like myself. Voting is a fundamental pillar of civic in participation. It is often the entry point for young individuals to influence and participate in democracy. While voting represents just one facet of civic engagement, it possesses critical first steps to create engaged citizens by empowering us to have our voices heard and shape issues that matter to our daily lives. Historically, youth voter turnout has fallen behind other significant demographics yet in recent elections have seen a massive growth in participation amongst young voters. Most notably, Minnesota students have led the nation in student voter turnout over the past three elections. While this is to be celebrated, disparities still exist. These disparities stem from unequal access to information and avenues for engagement, particularly across racial and ethnic lines, educational backgrounds, geographical regions, and age groups. Research conducted by the Center for Information and Research on Civic Learning and Engagement reveals that young non-voters often cite transportation challenges and inconvenient polling locations as one of the most significant barriers to voting. To address these barriers and disparities, 
opening on-campus polling places have been proven to be effective. For instance, in 2018, students at St. Paul College successfully implemented this approach, resulting in increased accessibility to voting for communities facing obstacles. Over the six-hour event, approximately 300 individuals casted their votes, with 100 of them being first-time voters. This event incurred minimal costs. The college waived the room fee as the student government sponsored it. The primary expense was covering the poll workers, totaling about $1,000. However, the true significance of this initiative lies in its simplification of the voting process, particularly for first-time voters. Lita Men facilitated voter registration, provided guidance on the voting procedure, and connected attendees with resources to learn about the candidates. I come from a family that has always valued voting and civic education. I can remember my Air Force veteran dad taking me to a polling location when I was about five years old. I can remember the excitement I felt knowing that I'd be able to vote when I'm older behind one of those plastic folding screens. I've seen voting as a way for us Americans to raise our voices and show our engagement in how our government functions. With the Constitution giving all eligible voters a right to vote, it is important that these eligible voters are given access to voting. As I entered into college, I became more civically engaged on my campus and soon lead a man. In my time, I learned how important it was for college students to make informed voting decisions. I've seen many students struggle or unable to get to polling locations. They may not have a license, a vehicle, or any other means of transportation to get to their polling locations. Public transportation like buses don't address this issue for many of our rural communities since accessibility is lackluster at best. These eligible voters would benefit from being able to have polling locations on their campuses, removing the transportation barrier that plagues many student voters. This legislation is a perfect opportunity to address one of the major hurdles to voting for our students and allow Minnesota to continue its streak of being one of the best in the nation at youth voter turnout and cultivating a new generation of active and empowered citizens like myself. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, our next testifier uh, is Shay Hornig. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. My name is Shay Horning, and I'm a sophomore at the University of Minnesota Twin Cities. I am the State Government Affairs Coordinator for the Undergraduate Student Government, and I'm here today to speak in support of SF 3616 because it would provide students with easier access to voting. In 2022, I had friends that wanted to vote in the midterm elections, but faced significant barriers to doing so. Friends that didn't have the transporta transportation resources to vote on election day, or whose schedules didn't allow them to take the time to leave campus. Even though I consider myself to be very politically engaged, as a full-time student who works multiple jobs, I can't even guarantee that I could carve out time in my day to go vote. Allowing post-secondary institutions or student government organizations to request an on-campus polling place eliminates these barriers. There are numerous statistics that highlight the barriers students at post-secondary institutions face when it comes to voting, many of which have already been outlined in the letters of support that have been submitted on behalf of this bill. While it's clear that there is a need for greater access to voting, I want to specifically address the concern that this bill would burden post-secondary institutions. The undergraduate student government's row the vote effort in the 2022 election cycle was the most successful voter registration and mobilization effort in university history. USG registered thousands of students to vote and shuttled similar numbers of students to polling locations both before and on election day. Funding for row the vote efforts came from outside grants and the existing USG budget. The campaign was led by USG members and student volunteers. While support from the university was immensely appreciated, it was by no means expected to be a burden as Row the Vote was a student-led effort. If USG were to request an on-campus polling place, these same sent sentiments would carry over. Row the Vote demonstrated that students across the University of Minnesota campus have a passion for voting so long as the resources are available to them. Allowing post-secondary institutions to request an additional on-campus polling place would provide students with these resources. Thank you. Thank you very much, testifiers, uh, and, Ms. and uh, Senator Mitchell for bringing this bill to us. Uh, members, do we have uh, questions and comments? Senator Duckworth. 
Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I appreciate it. I just have a couple of questions and a few comments <clears throat> for the author to consider as she uh, continues to work on the bill. But before I begin, is, is the idea to move this bill today to another committee or just to lay it over? Uh, Senator Duckworth, uh, the, the hopeful intention is to move the bill forward. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I appreciate that. Uh, thanks for the, your bill, Senator Mitchell. Quick question for you. You were talking about early voting uh, earlier. Um, so is the idea behind this that the polling place, <clears throat> if a college or university is working with the county, would, would be prior to election day, or would it also be uh, able to be uh, requested uh, for actual election day as well? Senator Mitchell. Thank you for the question, um, Mr. Chair, Senator Duckworth. Uh, so this is for an er one day early voting only. Counties, and sometimes they work with the cities, and sometimes the cities help run the elections, um, have to do their day of elections based on precincts. So that's why, you know, that one day that is the actual election day, you have to go to your specific polling spot. So they base those on how the precincts are cut and the spaces they have available. And um, we didn't have one of those testifiers with today, but when I brought this to elections, so someone explained that their precinct in one of the schools that was in Northfield wasn't anywhere near the school. And that's how the county had set that up. Um, not necessarily to impede the students, but just based on space and availability and all those things. And those, so the students were having to literally try and contract buses to get to the polling place, and the bus could only handle so many people, and then the lines, and then getting back, and then they might miss classes, all those things. So this would be one day of early voting, and that's why it would also accommodate more students, because it wouldn't necessarily be, have to be limited on precincts either, because for early voting, you do not have to vote in your precinct, you just have to vote in the county that you are located in. Senator Duckworth. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Mitchell. I appreciate that. Um, just a couple other things that uh, I would offer for consideration for the good of the conversation. Um, obviously, as a <clears throat> previous college student myself, I can relate to uh, trying to figure out where you're supposed to go and getting there and all that fun stuff, especially if you're, you don't necessarily have a car or you're not even allowed to, to have one on campus yet. Um, a couple of things I would give for, for consideration would be, <clears throat> could a college or university work with a county to get some place on, on campus designated as a ballot, ballot drop box area? And or could initiatives take place to help students with early mail-in voting um, if that's part of the challenge or part of the issue? A um, Couple of other things that, that I, would, I would wonder about this bill. <clears throat> if they're gonna have one day of early voting, um, Who's allowed to vote there? Is it is it anyone from anywhere in the state that would be allowed to vote there during that that uh, that that day where that polling place is being stood up? I guess that would be a question I would pose to you, Thank Senator Mitchell. Thank you for the question and for the suggestions. Um, I think it would be a great idea to have more drop boxes as well. This is specific to the early voting. <clears throat> and um, so, what would happen is they would have to put in the request by. Um, basically May before so that there was enough time for the school to work with the county or who was ever administering the election, find an appropriate space with disability parking, like all the things, right? Um, for this particular bill, we are homing in on uh, same day because there's also a lot of students who, it might even be their first time to vote. And Minnesota, uh, we're so wonderful that we also have same day registration. So especially for people who are new to voting. In this particular bill, we are valuing the access of them being able to come in because then we can answer all the questions, get them registered if they need to be registered, kind of get them through that first process. And especially if you're new, there's a little, I, I, you might not have seen me here on Tuesday, I was literally running an election site because I love this. Um, you know, we had some first time voters and I think they like to go in in, in person and like, do the actual thing that first time and, and give, get a little cheer for being their first vote. Um, so that would be the availability for that. For the second part of your question, it would be constituted like any other early voting in the state, which is that in Minnesota, we run our voting based on counties. So for example, I live in Washington County. We, throughout our very long county, have five early voting sites. And before election day, you can go to any of those five voting sites, but you cannot go to another county. 
So you have to stay within your county for early voting, and then on election day, you have to specifically be in your precinct. So for a college campus, um, let's say, I'm just gonna use my county again as an example. If it was one of my colleges in, in Washington County, anyone in Washington County could actually use that. Um, the school would probably use it the most, the students that are there, the faculty, if they lived in the county, could use it. Even local residents, that would be you know, a partnership of advertising that one day. But I will say a lot of early voting, um, we make it available because we want to, but I have friends that work at the early voting sites. Sometimes they'll only get 20 or 30 people a day for that early voting. Um, whereas I think if we do this one day pop up on the campuses, we could be serving you know, 100, 200 people. Um, so I really think it's kind of bang for the buck of what we would be able to do. Thank you, Senator Mitchell. Senator Duckworth. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you very much for that. So it, it sounds like uh, in your mind and, and the way the county would run this polling place, it would still have all the um, prerequisites um, that they would normally have at a particular polling place in terms of somebody's uh, residence or ensuring that they are in an area in which they would be permitted to vote based on where they live, whether that be uh, because they're a student at mm -hmm. that college or you mentioned employees earlier. Obviously, they would have to... Uh, ensure that they still lived within that area to be voting, whether or not they were an employee of that, of that uh, college or not. Um, I guess that that's really summarizes most of the questions that I had. Um, what I don't want to have happen or what I would hate to have happen is uh, there's a pop-up polling place at a college or a university um, and there's some confusion as to who can or can't vote there. Um, and I know the counties run a pretty good operation. They run a pretty tight ship asking them to do this. Uh, I, have a, I guess I should maybe talk to some folks at the county to say, hey, what are your thoughts on this? Mm -hmm. What do you see as maybe some logistical uh, challenges? Um, there's no doubt it's well intended and we want young folks voting, uh, but we also wanna make sure that we are making it as um, little complicated as possible. And if there are other means at which the county can partner with colleges and universities to do it, which might achieve it as well, I think that would be beneficial. So appreciate the bill. Uh, appreciate the uh, opportunity to comment, Mr. Chair. And it looks like I'll turn it over to one of my colleagues, maybe. Senator Murphy, please. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, thank you, Senator Mitchell, for bringing this. I, I represent in the district uh, a number of um, colleges and universities. Uh, and St. Thomas University has a new president, and I had the opportunity to meet with him before the end of last year, and this is one of the questions he raised with me. Um, would we be able to make it possible to have an additional polling place on campus? Um, and so I, I can't wait to call him and let him know that there's a piece of legislation moving through that would, um, in one way, accomplish something that they are looking for on that campus, which is to make it easier for students uh, on that campus to vote. Uh, so I just really want to thank you for perhaps reading the minds of the Mighty 64 <laughs> and helping us um, advance a goal. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Murphy. Senator Rarick. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, one of my questions, I guess, was answered earlier. This, so this has been to elections. Um, is it also going to state and local government? Uh, Senator Rick, yes, that is uh, a decision we will be making in probably about 47 seconds when we vote on it. All right. <laughs> thank, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. So that, um, I guess, I'm typically a stickler for sticking within the jurisdiction of a committee, so I'll just, you know, my biggest concern here is the fact that we're, you know, telling the county that they must do this upon the request. Uh, so hopefully they'll dig into that piece in uh, state and local government, uh, what the county's opinions are of that. Um, I would much rather, you know, see that we, we heard this is already happening in some places, and I would much rather see that the counties are allowed the freedom uh, to do it if it works for them. Um, but some of these smaller rural, uh, you know, counties that have a lot of rural area, um, that m they may have other plans in place, and I, I struggle with that. But hopefully they'll dig into that in uh, state and local government. So thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Rarick. And I'm sure that Senator Mitchell has, has taken this on advisement, and perhaps and, that's a voice that we'll hear there. Do you have a comment on this? And, and, and if I may, so uh, the 1500 means it would only in, in capture around the state of Minnesota 50. And the reason we didn't make this that they must just do this if it met one of the the um, criteria is is that 
if there is a university that is mostly commuters or something else, we want the flexibility to not require one of these sites unless the university or the students are saying, you know, we need the site. Um, so we didn't, we were mindful to not overburden in case a place wouldn't need this, that they weren't required to. That's why it was done in that way. Speaking with the counties, um, the biggest issue is that it would just be an extra day of uh, pay for the poll workers and the supplies, bringing the ballots, things of that nature. Um, so we'll work with the counties on that because uh, this would only be every two years for the general election. That's also kind of specified in this. It wouldn't be for every election. They're not even in school when we get the August primaries. So um, that should be a pretty small cost if we're just doing it on that basis. So we've worked with the counties on that. I will also add that the counties already do something similar. We um, go to uh, senior facilities that sometimes are much smaller than these universities because we value that that is also a population that might not have transportation. So um, for those, we only bring the ballots for those individuals. So this would be a little different in that respect. But um, the cities do all already have a framework for going into different sites on a one-day basis and being able to do this with the value similar like we do for our seniors, that this is a population um, um, and those are mandated. If you meet the criteria, they have to go to all of them. But uh, that we value people that might not be able to otherwise get to a poll should have that opportunity. Thank you very much for that explanation, Senator Mitchell. Uh, Senator Mitchell, do you have any closing comments? I, I just um, thank you all for considering this. As I said, um, we've had students from around the state really excited for this opportunity. Um, places that have had polling on campus for one means or the other, it is, it is highly used and very popular and um, really meaningful to our young voters. So thank you for your consideration. Thank you much for the presentation, Senator Mitchell. Um, members, uh, Senator Kupek moves that Senate File 3616 be passed and be re-referred to the Committee on State and Local Government. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Uh, Senate File 3616 has passed and been re-referred to the Committee on State and Local Government. Thank you, Senator Mitchell. Thank you. Uh, up next, folks, we have an informational hearing of sorts uh, around the status of contingent faculty in the state of Minnesota. Uh, Uh, folks, we have a number of testifiers and we want to hear from every single one of you to the full extent that we can. Uh, listening to your story is why we're here today. Um, but I will suggest that we have a number of testifiers in about 30 minutes for the presentation and the discussion. So I'll ask you to be uh, as expeditious as you can manage while retaining uh, uh, your commitment and illustration of your narrative. So we're going to start off, if I could, uh, Mr. Lindstrom, uh, if you would please uh, come to the desk, state your full name for the record, and commence your testimony when you're ready. Chair Putnam and members, my name is Kevin Lindstrom and I'm the president of the Minnesota State College faculty. MSCF represents approximately 4,000 faculty at the two-year colleges in the Minnesota State system. While it's typically my job to be the lead voice for our faculty, today my job is to listen more than I talk. And so I'll be brief in my remarks. In short, what I need to do is acknowledge my privilege in this conversation. I have a position and title which gives me access and voice. I have a permanent full-time job. I have a consistent paycheck. I have reliable health care coverage. I can exercise my academic freedom and speak to you today without the fear of losing my job. You're going to hear testimony from faculty today who do not share in much of that privilege. You have written testimony from faculty who have stories to share but only feel comfortable doing so in writing and often anonymously. In the coming minutes, you will hear from our members as they share their experiences as contingent faculty employed by Minnesota State. Some key themes you will hear focus on lack of stability and job security and the impact this has on insurance eligibility. We know that around 40% of the faculty in our bargaining unit are contingent, which means they live in constant uncertainty regarding their future employment. Despite a contractual appointment type of temporary part-time, we know over half of our contingent faculty have been continually employed in the system for seven or more years, and many of them teach at or near a full load. They are neither temporary nor part-time. In spite of the ongoing availability of work 
And despite of their ongoing commitment to our campuses, students, and communities, these faculty continue to work without the job stability and security they deserve. That's why today I need to listen more than I talk, and I need to remain committed to acting on what I hear. I invite you to join me. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Lindstrom. Members, we do have a number of testifiers. If you have a question or a comment for a specific testifier, I'm going to ask you to, to notify me of that. Uh, uh, my intention is that we will go through the testifiers and then have a discussion at the close of all of the testifiers, unless there's someone specifically you want to talk to with a specific question. Mr. Jeffrey, if you would please, um, could you uh, have a seat, state your full name for the record, and commence your testimony when you're ready. Hello, my name is Stephen Jeffrey. Um, thank you, Senators, for allowing me to talk today. My name is Stephen Geffrey, as I stated, and I have been a faculty member at the St. Paul Community and Technical College since 2013. I'm here to talk about the issue of rollovers, or actually the lack of rollovers, happening around the Min-State system, or the min system. Just to clarify, the min contract with MSCF has language about adjunct faculty members becoming an unlimited full-time faculty. Unlimited full-time faculty, or UFT, basically is the tenure of our contract. According to the contract, an adjunct faculty works, that works for 12 semesters with a full load, meaning 15 credits a semester, will automatically be rolled over to a UFT faculty. The rationale behind this benefit was that if a faculty member is working for a full six years, they should have, get the benefit and responsibility of a UFT faculty member. One catch. If you work six consecutive years with 30 credits or more, if you fall below that 30 credits, the clock starts over. You do not get UFT. You have to spend another six years trying to get it. This sadly happened to me, and I was denied UFT status during my 11th semester. Here's my story. I made it. I had a great student and dean reviews. I made it through the pandemic. I even stepped up and made online curriculum for a coworker during the pandemic. At the, at the end of my 11th semester of working full time as an adjunct, my schedule was, shuff, my schedule was shuffled around so I would only be teaching 28.5 credits that year, meaning that I wouldn't reach the 30 credit threshold and thus not allowing me to roll over to a UFT faculty member I even had a coworker and friend offer to give me a class, taking money away from him and his family to make me a full-time faculty member. The administration denied this. This all happened right before winter break of 2020, right before Christmas. I remember my frustration, sadness, and an overwhelming feeling of self-doubt as I cried doing the dishes in my Apple Valley home. Did I do something wrong? Was I not worth this benefit? Was I not as good of a teacher as I thought I was? Was I not a valued member of this college community? The answer to these questions was clearly no, but it took me a while to figure that out. I realized this decision had nothing to do with me personally. The reason I was denied was simply that Minsky's system did not want to live up to the rollover benefit supporting adjunct faculty in our contract, a benefit that was negotiated in good faith by both parties was being flagrantly ignored by the system. And I'm not the only one this happens to. I had a coworker who worked 12 years and was denied twice this. He now is, lives in another state and works at another college. I'd be remiss if I didn't tell you another story. When I was five years old, my dream job was to be a cowboy priest who drove race cars on the weekend. <laughs> At this time, I didn't own a horse, I didn't have a car, and I didn't know what the priesthood entailed. <laughs> Once I figured out there was no real way of attaining that dream, I found another. You see, my dad's a college teacher, and I used to love to go to him, go to college with him. I loved the connection he made with students, the positive influence he had on their lives, and I found my true dream job. I wanted to teach at the college level, yet this job seemed as out of reach as a race car driving priest as because I'm dyslexic and dysgraphic. Reading and writing don't come easy. It wasn't until I found art, specifically photography, that I found my true calling. I spent 20 years 
in the photo industry as a photojournalist and a staff photographer at a local university before I was confident enough in my skills to teach adult learners. I have also gone on to expand my own education with a master's in sculpture from Minnesota State Mankato. You see, I put a lot of effort into my dream job and I'm taking a risk in speaking in front of you today. I have no protection from losing this job. In fact, no adjunct professor has protection from not having their contract renewed. Professors like me have spent countless hours working to obtain the credentials to teach at this level. And for many of them, this is their dream job too. And speaking publicly could cause negative consequences on their career. Now, I trust my dean and I trust my administration, but others may not. I am just one of many stories that could be shared today, but others may not have the support of friends and family. In fact, my wife, an eighth grade English teacher who works way harder than I ever will, is here to support me. We feel we must do this. It is too important to stay silent. And if something happens, we'll figure it out. I am here to say in a loud, passionate, and respectful voice, the Minnesota State College and University system is treating adjunct faculty unfairly. It's not right and it needs to change. They need to honor the benefits they have negotiated in good faith with our union and start treating adjuncts faculty with the respect they deserve. Thank you for your patience, your time, and your concern on this issue. Thank you, Mr. Geffrey. Uh, next up is uh, Rachel Herring. If you would please, Ms. Herring, come to the, the table. State your full name for the record and commence your testimony when you are ready. My name is Rachel Herring. Thank you, Chair, Ranking Member, and Committee Members for the opportunity to speak with you today. I am a member of MSCF and a faculty member and program director in the Translation and Interpreting Program at Century College. Our program is the only college level uh, educational opportunity for spoken language interpreters and translators in the state of Minnesota. We are very proud of the work we do and our students' contributions to equity of access and effective communication throughout the state. I have been a faculty member in this program since the fall semester of 2011. And since fall of 2017, I have been the program director and the principal, often only, faculty member teaching in the program. For all of these nearly 13 years, my employment status has been that of a contingent faculty member. The number of credits I teach varies from semester to semester. Similarly to the colleagues whose written and oral testimony is being submitted to you today, I have encountered situations in which my costs for health insurance have varied widely from semester to semester, my pay has varied widely, and I have had many issues with paperwork, logistics, coverage gaps, and payment errors related to this instability and changes. Like my colleagues who have submitted a written testimony to you today, I have faced anxiety and stress related to uncertainty with regard to income and with regard to insurance coverage and benefits. While recognizing that there are many demands on your time, I commend the written testimonies submitted to you to your attention and um, thank you for your attention to them. In adding my voice and my perspective to their stories, I would like to highlight an additional aspect of contingent faculty's work and experiences. As I mentioned, although I lead and am often the only faculty member in a career and technical program, I am also contingent faculty. It may be surprising to learn that a program is led by contingent faculty rather than by unlimited full-time faculty. However, this is not an uncommon situation, particularly for small or unique career and technical programs. I am fortunate to work in an institution whose leadership is supportive of my program and of me and my work, and I do appreciate the value that our leadership places on our work. However, at the same time, I am always aware of the fact that my employment status is contingent. I am conscious of the benefits of the strong union contract between MSCF and MinState, but as we heard with our previous testimony, we must always be aware of the ways in which the protections that contingent faculty have are distinct from those in effect for unlimited full-time faculty. We must also always be aware, and I personally am always aware, 
of ways in which institutional and leadership variables may affect aspects of my work, or in fact, whether or not I have work. My contingent status and my awareness of that status are realities. They do not, however, define or limit the scope of my work, my dedication to my students, or the depth and breadth of my engagement with the mission and the vision of the college and of Minnesota State as an institution. While I cannot speak for other colleagues whose situations are analogous to mine, I feel and I suspect that if you were able to speak with all of them, you would hear similar expressions about involvement and dedication. I hope that the testimony you are hearing and reading related to today's hearing is giving you a better understanding not only of the precarities and the difficulties and the stresses that contingent faculty undergo, but also of the extent of their engagement with and their commitment to our students and our communities. Um, as the oral and written testimony submitted to you starkly illustrates, contingent faculty face a number of challenges related to the precarious nature of their employment, the variability of their employment, um, quantity, how much they're working, their pay, and their benefits. I thank you for your time and attention today and in the future, and I appreciate your um, engaging with the issues and stories being shared with you today. Thank you very much, Ms. Herring. Uh, next, we have uh, Faith Erickson. Ms. Erickson, if you would please state your full name for the record and commence your testimony when you are ready. Thank you, Chair, Ranking Member, and all the committee members. My name is Faith Erickson. I've been teaching English composition and literature at both St. Cloud Technical and Community College and St. Cloud State University for the past 15 years. I appreciate the chance to speak with you today. I have to say I really appreciate the chance to hear my colleagues' stories. Uh, for the first 12 years of service as a teacher at St. Cloud State's University and Community College, I found myself growing more frustrated, delusioned, depleted, and anxious about what would come from one semester to the next. There are about two short months of some semblance of security before you worry about the next semester's schedule. And that's not just a schedule, of course, that's your pay, your insurance, your retirement, your ability to pay back school loans, other bills, feed your family. Not knowing what will happen for longer than a couple months stretch that could be exciting after grad school before you move on to a real job. That's not the contingent faculty of today. These are career educators with terminal degrees, often multiple, who have been loyal to our system. 15% of MSCF's contingent faculty have taught consistently in Min State for 20 or more years, 40% for 10 or more years, over 50% for seven or more, and yet the reason they go through the trauma of such unpredictability is because the system doesn't know if they can be offered stability. They clearly can. This incessant instability takes its toll in nearly every way. The physical demands of taking on every opportunity you can to prove yourself, the mental impact of never knowing what's coming, never even being offered the illusion that stability is in your future, despite knowing you have been foundational to your college. I've been teaching consistently since 2009 with credit loads dipping around the 30 credit, like my colleagues, to keep me temporary. I've yet to understand the difference between what I do and what my full-time colleagues do to justify the strain and uncertainty me and my family endure. I started with a good degree and to, I'm sorry, I started with a good degree and a lot of student debt, and I've gone back to school a few more times at a grasping attempt to prove I was worthy of a full-time position. I've had my indignities and my pains. I've taken out of my retirement a few times, which led to tax debt, which led to financial trouble. I worry about my four-year-old son's future. And when I was burned up, I asked for help. And the advice I got, I think, was meant as a throwaway. If you want to do something, go to the state level and do something, thinking I wouldn't. And that's a fair guess, because so many contingent faculty are scared to speak. You cannot be hired back for no reason. There's no protection. And only because I had gotten to the point of mad, I did. I went to the state level. So three years ago, I began working with MSCF as the rep for contingent faculty on the executive board, as a member of the bargaining team, and as the chair of the temporary faculty committee. And back to the beginning of my testimony, what an honor it has been to hear the stories of my colleagues. And throughout my time with MSCF, I found that getting these stories was my goal and has been my honor. And it's 
pretty precious because they are hard to get. So I, I want to use my time to tell a few anonymous stories. One I heard last night. Um, there are often just one or two full-time faculty in, in trades programs, and the rest are contingent faculty. This can be very difficult, because when you treat people like they're temporary, how can you expect them to put in extra time for assessment and everything else that needs to be done to keep a program running? How can you ask for professional development for faculty when you don't know if they're going to be back next year? Not because they don't want to, but because the system won't commit to them. Um, an instructor described as exceptional by his full-time colleague. Um, in fact, the only instructor, this contingent faculty, who was certified in the way that the program needed was on the edge of quitting because he didn't have access to health care when his wife needed surgery. He was very afraid he would have to and was very close to having to pay a $30,000 medical bill out of pocket. Another instructor chose to get married, went unsure if she wanted to get married, because of the need for insurance. Another instructor had one course at four different schools, 8 a.m. one morning, evening the same day at another, next day 8 a.m. And because you need six credits at just one institution to be covered for insurance, she was not covered for insurance, despite teaching four different schools, running herself ragged, running from one school to another. When I was on the bargaining team for MSCF and we were talking about insurance, I was really emotionally impacted by it all. You can ask my team members. And suddenly I remembered that when I started teaching, um, maybe around 2010, I was asked if I could take over an online course a little over halfway through the semester. And of course, I, I, would, I would. I would do anything that my dean asked me to do. And um, it turned out the original instructor was dying of cancer. She wanted to make sure her insurance was covered so her kids didn't have to pay too much after she was gone. And so she was teaching up until the very last minute. Um, she died while um, she was, not while she was teaching the class, but she died in th that semester and then I took over. Um, I just remember thinking that no matter how much I love teaching, I did not want to spend the last few weeks of my life teaching an online composition class and I did not want to worry about the financial burden not doing that would have on my son. The impact on students is immense when our teachers are mentally and physically broken. Their mental health, and when their mental health and their physical health is ignored. When they feel unwanted. When their decades of consistent full-time service means nothing. It's a false premise that these teachers can't be afforded some kind of security. Contingent faculty have been a stable force in our system, just without the benefit of that. We would love more time to talk to you. We would love legislative solutions for insurance. It's been done in other states. We, um, we would even love legislative solutions for work access. That too has been done in other states. If you're concerned about academic integrity, think about how the insecurity of contingent leads to that. If you're concerned about payroll errors, think about how the inconsistency of contingency leads to that. The system uses teachers who stay in abhorrent conditions for decades because of their good nature and their love of teaching. It burns them up, robs, them of, robs students of access to these teachers as full and healthy individuals. What type of teachers would these students receive if we were able to offer them some semblance of security? I really appreciate your time and we welcome your questions. Thank you, Ms. Erickson. Uh, next is Ms. Oliver, if you would please. Hi, my name's Emily Oliver. I want to thank uh, the chair and the committee for making the time today to hear these stories. I currently teach in writing, literature, and language and through the Trek Prison Education Program at Metropolitan State University and in Cultural Studies and Comparative Lit the Cultural Studies Comparative Literature Department at the University of Minnesota. I also serve as the convener of the Community Faculty or Contingent Faculty Caucus for Metro's IFO Union Chapter, organizing other part-time faculty to support our full and vivid participation in shared governance. We are here today because higher ed has been defunded by the state and federal government for decades, and as a result of these conditions of austerity, um, our universities and community colleges are balancing their budgets on the back of contingent faculty. At Metro State, where I work, 71% of the people who teach there are contingent. Despite representing the majority of faculty, we are paid 
a minimum credit rate regardless of our years of experience, we enjoy no job security, and most of us must frantically divide our work week across multiple institutions to make ends meet. Despite functionally teaching full time for the state of Minnesota, I had no access to paid leave when my beautiful daughter Alma was born last spring and had no guarantee I would have courses again when I was able to return to work. Like so many of my colleagues, I am a gifted teacher and I adore my work in the classroom, but the chair of my department is not permitted to hire me for more than 12 credits. I'm in a position where the horizon of my professional advancement is determined not by student evaluations or my accomplishments in my field, but by an arbitrary credit limit imposed by the administration so that the university is not on the hook for benefits. At every single community caucus, a community faculty caucus meeting, I hear more stories of the unjust and abject working conditions my colleagues face but I also get to hear the stories about why they stay, um, about the remarkable people who show up in our classes at Metro. My students are often caregivers. They attend work and school full time. Um, some of my students are currently incarcerated. And yet, despite managing these incredibly difficult, complex circumstances, they engage in our coursework with profound determination and sincerity. The state of Minnesota and our institutions of higher education are taking advantage of the pride, awe, and admiration that contingent faculty have for these students. We are exclusively paid for our time in the classroom, but uh, of course we write that letter of recommendation. Of course we meet with a student who's struggling. Of course we serve on the committee to make our institution better. All of these uncompensated activities are donations contingent faculty are making to the state of Minnesota out of the love we have for our students. But they deserve better and so do we. Our working conditions are our students' learning conditions. As a teacher and as a citizen, I am overjoyed that 2024 will be the first year of Minnesota's North Star Promise, providing free college for students whose family makes under $80,000 a year. Um, this, uh, ad, the advent of this bold and dynamic program demands corresponding investment in improving the working conditions faced by contingent faculty. Across institutions, we need robust funding to support ethical workplaces. We deserve job security, health benefits, and fair pay. And all students deserve faculty with stable employment so that the educators they bond with and are mentored by are still around to support them in subsequent semesters. I'm so grateful for your time uh, and considering uh, both my, written, uh, my spoken testimony and the written testimony we provided. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Oliver. Next up is uh, Chris Freikum, please. Freikum. Uh, please state your full name for the record and commence your testimony when you're ready. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, everyone on the committee, my name is Chris Frickman, and I work at Metropolitan State University. Our university mantra, of course, is equity and inclusion. However, um, why doesn't the university um, amplify equity and inclusion for the 75 75% of faculty that are contingent, as Emily was saying? Do you know in my 22 to 23 years at Metropolitan State University, I make the same amount of money as a first year faculty member? Is that equitable? We have what is known as senior community faculty, those who have taught 10 consecutive semesters. They qualify for that wonderful title. It is a title. There's no bells, whistles, anything that comes with it, no added pay. Is that equitable? Do you know that our teaching cap is 12 credits, as Emily had just mentioned? Um, administrators don't want to pay for health care. They don't want us be, to be bumped up on a, uh, on a pay scale uh, other than the credit pay scale. Case in point, this year, I was given the credit load of 11.9 credits for the year. That's a statement right there. Let's keep it under the bar. And yet, um, so what did I do? I reached out to uh, my union rep who reached out and found out that we have a labor lawyer 
And we learned, or the administrators learned that yes, indeed, community faculty, contingent faculty can indeed teach 12 credits. And no, they don't have to pay us any more. But they are able now to give us um, the option for health care. So that worked well for me because I was able to teach 12 credits and I was able to um, work, choose or opt into health care. Community faculty and adjunct all our state employees, and we all should be entitled to opt in or opt out of health care. As, as you know, community faculty are only paid to teach. Um, so when do we prep? We don't get paid for prep. We, are, um, we don't have an office on campus. We pay for all the equipment that we need. Um, computers, laptops, paper, ink, you name it, we, we pay for it. Uh, if we need an ergonomic chair, we buy that ourselves. We Zoom with students, we meet with them off campus. We love what we do. We are there for the greater good of the students, so it'd be nice if we had something coming back for the greater good of all of us, 75% at Metro State. So um, just yesterday I spent $100 on uh, ordered some textbooks because I'm slated to teach a new course in, in fall. So there's no slush fund. My resident faculty colleagues have a slush fund for just that and for office supplies and anything else that they might need. And three years ago, I was slated to teach an advanced writing course. And I had done all the prep and got ready and was excited for this new course. And two weeks before um, the semester started, the chair of the department contacted me and said, you know, a resident faculty is, does not have enough credits for her year. I am partnering her with you. And so this resident faculty, as nice as they are, or were, still are, I'm sure, um, <laughs> had uh, no clue of the course endeavors, unfamiliar with the course books. And so I spent two weeks of my time basically in boot camp to so that we could get up to speed so we were prepared for our students. Now, we only had eight students enroll for this course, and they did, needed 10 to jumpstart the course. Bottom line, the course was canceled. I was um, out of luck. You know what the word goes before with that. Um, and the resident faculty was given another uh, opportunity to teach. So no pay for any of my personal time there. So for the... Um, so I end with, is that equitable? For the 75% of us known as community faculty that teach 75% of all courses at Metro State, we are paid a pittance for our time, our expertise, and dedication to teaching while administrators' paychecks continue to inflate, and um, the 25% of resident faculty gain all the benefits. Is that equitable? Equity and inclusion is being promoted in name by our university, yet 75% of faculty are not being treated equi equitably. Thank you so much for hearing our pleas. As you can see, we definitely need your support. So thank you for Minister, listening. I actually have a question before you leave, if you don't mind. Um, yes. But I'm just a humanist, so I don't math. Um, but what is a 0.9 of a credit? Is that a <laughs> is that a real thing? Like, do you do you just end ten minutes early? Is, is that uh, 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 can you explain? Uh, perhaps um, uh, I, I'm being facetious, but I'm also quite curious. At, at, at Metro State, what is the court course? What is the credit total for a typical uh, course? Three or four credits, and I love your question. Um, <laughs> yes, 0.9. Go figure. It's uh, it is a literal statement by our department chairs to keep the man down, so to speak, keep the woman down in this case. Um, I am not a math wizard in that regards either, but three or four credits is, is um, typical for a, a course. And so um, the resolution was if we, if you're off a point one or point two credits, then you need to have another faculty person join you so they could take on that point, whatever it is. Oh, I see. So you, the, the final point one was made up by someone else, because I'm wondering, in terms of student graduate, like no student is taking a class that is 2.9 credits. No, no, it would not impact our students 
by signing up for a course, but it could impact them um, because they'd have multiple instructors for a specific course. Thank you. Thank you for that clarification. Ms. Thank you. I didn't practice. This happened to me this semester. You just get docked yeah. 0.5 credit. I mean, you just get docked, docked pay. I mean, the other instructor is not going to do 0.1 amount sure. of work. It's okay. just, it's just. Smooth. I'm sorry, Ms. Uh, you, we have to speak into the microphone for the record. So, um, if if you if you'd like to explain this further, please come back to the desk, if you would. Both Sorry, people who are watching at home need to be able to hear you. <laughs> <laughs> um, in, re in practice, what happens is you just get docked pay. I mean, you're, it, you're, it's really hard to ask another colleague to do point one of work, or in my credit, in my, uh, uh, this semester, I had to give another faculty person half a credit, which is the equivalent of $800, money I need. Uh, and of course, like, what can you really ask someone for half a credit? It's like it, it's more work to sort of figure out what that person can do. So, uh, sorry to <laughs> break the rules. Thank you very much for uh, uh, adding that information, uh, members. We have about five minutes for questions and discussions uh, uh, of this issue. I think initially, though, we should thank all these faculty for showing up and for their service to the state of Minnesota. And I do want to pick up just briefly as we begin this conversation with something that Ms. Erickson uh, brought up earlier. Uh, and that's kind of defining what it is and understanding what a contingent faculty person is. Um, I can tell you when I was in graduate school, I taught at Century College for extra money. That's not what contingent faculty are anymore. Uh, and you aren't even contingent when you're part of the plan. The individuals might be contingent, but the class is not. Uh, so uh, perhaps that can be a foundation for some of our conversation. Uh, members, questions, concerns, comments? Uh, for uh, the status of contingent faculty workers in the state of Minnesota. Senator Mover Braden. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just want to thank you all for being here. It's, it's just um, awful to hear about what you're experiencing. And I have not, not for seven years, but been in a situation of like a temporary position um, waiting for those benefits, and to hear that you're doing that on a semester-by-semester -semester basis is just awful. Um, and the impact that has on the, having health insurance and your families, um, yeah, just, just really hard. And I'm very committed to looking at the legislative solutions for that. Um, I don't know. I'm just sort of blown away. I just wanted to share... Um, like how much I empathize with that and having been in a sort of similar situation, but just um, that those timelines are really tight. And um, we, I mean, with 75% at Metro State, like you're, you are part of the plan. Um, so there just has to be a better way to do it. And thank you for your service. And um, one of you folks talked about working with incarcerated students and I'm carrying our package on that this year. So really passionate about that issue. Um, just hate seeing like workers be taken advantage of, especially because you're in these jobs because you care so much about our kids, care so much about those students. You talked about, of course, we're going to write those letters of recommendation. Of course, we're going to stay in and talk with you all. You're like, we're taking advantage of the fact that you care so much about the work that you do. Um, so we just have to find a better way. But thank you for your service and um, here to help. Thank you. Thank you for yours. <laughs> Absolutely. Are there any additional questions from members? Thank you so much for coming out today. Thank you for your testimony. Thank we'll you, now Mr. move on Chair. to yes. Uh, thank you, colleagues. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you so much. We'll now move on to Senator Putnam's bill, Senate File Forty Four Sixteen. Senator Putnam, uh, would you like to move your A1 author's amendment? Yes, please, Mr. Chair. Uh, Senator Putnam moves the A1 amendment. All those in favor say aye. 
Uh, those opposed? The amendment is adopted. Senator Putnam. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair, uh, for uh, taking the opportunity to uh, discuss this very important issue that we have before us today. This bill uh, as a whole is fairly simple. Uh, as you can see, especially in, in its amended state, where, uh, which is the result of conversations with OHI and with MinState. Sorry, John's been told me to come up. It's okay. It's okay. Uh, I'm also particularly glad to have a chance to talk about this bill right after we heard from our friends who are contingent faculty, because it gives us an opportunity to think a little bit about what it's like to be a faculty member in a university or a college in the state of Minnesota today. We talk a lot about education, we talk a lot about the systems, but we don't often, I think, focus on what's different or particular about being a university faculty person. Um, and I, I know that Senator Eric loves it when I pontificate, so even though this bill is pretty simple, I still want to say uh, that um, uh, being a professor is a different kind of job. Uh, each job has its own requirements, its own uh, 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 responsibilities. Uh, I think that uh, sometimes and too often lately in our culture, we denigrate expertise. Uh, we uh, don't realize that it takes work to be an expert at something. And in our universities, hopefully we can respect the expertise of those who have done the work to earn it. And that is the impetus behind this bill we have before us today, uh, which we are calling basically an academic freedom bill. Uh, what this bill does is very, very simple, uh, both uh, intellectually and in terms of, of actual practices. Uh, in terms of practices, all this does is codify what is already in the contracts at Minnesota State faculty. So Minnesota State faculty already have these rights and obligations as they're identified here, enumerated in their contract. Uh, this bill simply codifies those rights. Uh, and those rights are incredibly important these days, especially when we are so skeptical of expertise these days uh, across the board, but particularly in education. People who teach colleges and uh, in universities, uh, in, in addition to those who teach them uh, in E12 context, but we do this in colleges, we've done a lot of work to design the classes that we teach. It's called intellectual property on purpose. Uh, and so protecting and preserving those rights is incredibly important, Mr. Chair. Uh, and I have two testifiers here to help me make the case. Thank you, Senator Putnam. Uh, Ms. Jenna Chirego, welcome. Please introduce yourself for the record and proceed. Thank you, Chair Fatah, Senators. My name is Jenna Chernega, and I'm a professor of sociology at Winona State University and president of the IFO. We represent faculty, coaches, counselors, and librarians at the seven universities in the Minnesota State System. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today, and thank you to Senator Putnam for bringing this bill. In 1940, the American Association of University Professors and the Association of American Colleges and Universities agreed upon the Statement of Principles of Academic Freedom and Tenure. This document, often referred to as the 1940 Statement, has laid out the definitions, privileges, and responsibilities of the American professorate for the last 84 years. The 1940 Statement describes the importance of academic freedom in no uncertain terms. Freedom in research, it says, is fundamental to the advancement of truth. Academic freedom in teaching is fundamental for the protection of the rights of the teacher in teaching and of the student in learning. In short, professors and administrators agreed that academic freedom is a cornerstone of higher education. Unfortunately, today, we must, work to act, we must act to protect academic freedom because we see that cornerstone crumbling in other areas of the country. By the summer of 2023, eight states had enacted laws aimed at higher education with curriculum content restrictions. Legislatures in 12 additional states were considering similar bills uh, restricting curriculum. We've been especially watching the impact of legislation in Texas and Florida on the academic freedoms of faculty in those states. As Senator Putnam mentioned, the language in this bill comes from the IFO and MSCF contracts, two documents that protect academic freedom. However, have we, as we have seen in uh, Wisconsin and in Florida, co union contracts are only as strong as the labor-friendly legislatures that support them. Shifts in the politics of Minnesota could render our contracts moot if Pelro were to be revised or rescinded. Act 10 in Wisconsin and recent actions in Florida to decertify faculty unions are examples of how tenuous those, those protections are. To emphasize the importance of academic freedom to our faculty members, I'm going to cite a survey that we conducted of our membership in 2015. 
The survey was developed and administered by an outside organization and was meant to help us gauge the highest priorities of our faculty members. What did they want us to pursue most at the bargaining table? What were the biggest benefits of having a faculty union? The consultants warned us before we opened the results that higher wages would be the number one priority. It always is, they assured us, in these kinds of surveys. However, as the spreadsheet populated with our members' responses, we saw something astonishing. Protecting academic freedom was their top priority. More than wages, benefits, workloads, or any of the typical topics of bargaining, it was protecting their freedom to research and teach about their areas of expertise without fear of punishment or losing their jobs that they valued the most. With this bill, Minnesota has the opportunity to again distinguish itself as a destination for the best and brightest from around the country. We have the opportunity to say that we not only value education, but we particularly value education that espouses a diversity of opinions, that includes a variety of voices, and that empowers college and university faculty to do what they do best, to research and teach the truth. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for your testimony, Ms. Chernega. Uh, next up, we have uh, Ms. Monica Erling from Hennepin Technical College. Welcome. Please introduce yourself for the record and proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Ranking Member, and Committee Members uh, for giving me the opportunity to speak today. Uh, my name is Monica Erling. I am in my 14th year of teaching sociology at Hennepin Technical College. You heard earlier the statement uh, that you hear often from educators that our working conditions are our students' learning conditions. This is especially true for the issue of academic freedom. I teach classes about race, and criminal justice to groups of mostly peace officer students. They come to the profession for all different reasons and bring with them ideas that are as diverse as Minnesota itself. My challenge as an educator is to create a classroom environment based on mutual trust in which students feel safe sharing their authentic experiences and worldviews with one another, regardless of their political beliefs. In doing so, they learn from and gain profound respect for each other. I build that environment of trust by providing absolute assurance that all perspectives are welcome and valued. But I also ask every single student to vigorously interrogate and reflect upon their own perspectives in light of new information from me and from their classmates. That process can be uncomfortable, but I teach them how to transcend their discomfort and see the value in it. I tell them learning is like lifting weights. It makes you stronger, but leaves you a little sore for a while. I can only provide that assurance and that environment of trust and safety if I am assured of my own safety in bringing difficult topics before my students. If I am working in fear of facing sanctions for exploring topics that don't fit the political agenda of one side of the aisle or the other, then my students, all of them, will experience the same fear of speaking their own minds in class. We are unable to build trust, and when trust dies, learning dies. When I lose my academic freedom, they lose theirs. Teaching and learning is all about the relationships formed in the classroom. Political interference, conservative or liberal, profoundly undermines the learning process, even more so than it undermines the breadth of content covered. So, in the name of learning, I ask you to support SF4416 to guarantee academic freedom to Minnesota uh, state faculty and students. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much for your testimony, Ms. Erling. Are there any questions or comments from committee members? Ranking Member Duckworth. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I appreciate it. Uh, thank you, Senator Putnam and others that have testified. <clears throat> I'm getting old, but I'd like to think I'm not that far removed from some of the uh, colleges and universities here in the great state of Minnesota. I'm a product of a couple of them anyway. And uh, I'm just curious. Obviously, some of what's been shared today um, is concerning to hear, um, and, I, and I, I'm trying to gauge the prevalence of it. Um, I'm trying to gauge if there is some sort of mass censorship of, of professors occurring across colleges and universities in Minnesota, which if, if, which if was the case would be shocking to me, given that we are Minnesota 
our, our dedication to uh, academics and, and free speech in general, especially in places of higher education. I think folks know, and there's kind of an understanding, and maybe it's stereotypical, I don't know that when you go to college, that's where uh, it's, it's fair game. Free speech, differences of opinions, diversity in thought, all, all of that encouraged. Um, and as we look at this bill and as it, as it relates to faculty, I think it's important and something could be said for also adding some language that uh, has it apply to students as well. So I offer that as some thought to you, Senator Putnam, as you continue working on this bill. But are there, are there any particular uh, instances that, that, that stick out that, that you can point to to kind of help us all gauge in the public gauge just how prevalent this might be in our colleges and universities across the state? Thank you. Uh, Senator Putnam. Thank you, Senator Dothrick. That's a, that's a pretty good question for someone who went to St. Thomas. <laughs> I was purposely trying to keep that under wraps. <laughs> <laughs> no, Senator Dothrick, you make, you make an excellent point. Uh, and that um, there are no currently in the state of Minnesota, to my estimation or my knowledge, uh, mass waves of, of censorship that are occurring. But again, uh, I think when we look at a more granular level and look at different faculty in different positions, they might answer that question differently. Uh, there might be a sense of, as we heard earlier from our friends who are contingent, who don't push as hard as they'd like to because they don't have protections like this more explicitly stated. So there isn't a sense of sort of prophylactic dimension to this and that we don't want to have widespread uh, censorship of any kind. But I can say that, you know, um, uh, it doesn't not happen. Uh, from my own personal experience, I can testify to that as well. And sometimes it's subtle. Sometimes it's a, a, a passive statement somehow of, oh, you sure you should be teaching this, or one of those kinds of things. So it might not be necessarily identifiable in terms of a university administration's uh, uh, official statement of policy. Um, but it is something that I think we need to be very concerned about. And, and perhaps further evidence of why it's a concern is it currently exists in the IFO contracts. So clearly there's something that we need to do here. And this is simply just doing that more assertively. But again, I'll defer to my testifiers if they have more to say. So, Mr. Nick. Thanks so much, Chair Fatah, um, Senator Duckworth. I, I agree that there are not huge problems right now in the Minnesota system. I would never have guessed that Wisconsin, with the great higher education program that they have had, would be facing this kind of legislation just across the river but that is what's going on in Wisconsin. It began with Act 10 and the decertification of faculty unions, and then it has proceeded to be legislation introduced at the state level that restricts what campuses can and cannot talk about, what kinds of work they can do, what kinds of work can happen on those campuses, and there's been contemplation of the same kind of uh, curriculum restrictions that we see in multiple other states right now. Mr. Chair, if I may continue on this line for just one moment. No. Uh, Right. Senator Putnam. <laughs> uh, probably, I want to say maybe 15 years ago, as an academic conference at the University of Wisconsin in Madison. And at that time, there was a change in leader, political leadership in that state. And a number of very prominent faculty members at the University of Minnesota left, at the University of Madison, left that school because of some of the political currents and the politicization of what was happening in university classrooms and uh, some of the other decisions that were being made. So this is also a, a workforce issue and a talent retention issue because we need to keep great faculty members, great scholars, great intellectuals in the state of Minnesota. And what better way to do that than to say that we are actually committed to intellectual labor, that we believe that there's something valuable in thinking hard about an issue and doing the work to speak about it in a way that helps other people. That's really the essence of what this bill does. Thank you, Senator Putnam. Senator Duckworth. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Putnam. I appreciate it. I do have a follow-up question uh, specifically regarding some of the language in the bill. On uh, page two, uh, letter C talks about, I'll just read it out loud real quick, it's lines 2.1 to 2.4. A Minnesota state institution shall not discriminate against a faculty member for engaging in political activities or holding or voicing political views so long as the exercise of this right does not interfere with the faculty member's job responsibilities as a faculty member. Um, and if you turn the page backwards one, there's lines 1.16 to 1.17 that talk about faculty rights and basically say that they apply to discussing the subject matter in the classroom of the courses the faculty member is assigned to teach. So I'm curious, 
does that paragraph, paragraph C, as it relates to engaging in political activities, voicing political views, et cetera, apply uh, generally, or is it specific to discussing the subject matter in the classroom of the courses the faculty member is assigned to teach? Just looking for some clarity. Sure. Thank you. So, Dr. Wood, that's an excellent question. Um, I, I think in my reading of it, the uh, point C has to do with any point wherein someone were stating something that was not germane to their area of expertise when engaged in political behavior. So for example, even though I'm still faculty at St. John's right now, the votes I take down here cannot be used to discipline me. That's just the law. And so I think that's what C is kind of referring to. But there are those moments when we might teach things that might be partisan. I teach about politics sometimes. Um, I do a day teaching on George Wallace. That doesn't mean I support what he has to say or what he believes. So I can teach about things that are political without advocating for them in the classroom. And that's another one of my issues and why I think this bill is so important is that so often we take things out of context. If you looked at my syllabi for the classes that I teach, you would have no idea what my party identification is. Um, and uh, if you looked at one day though, you could say it was far right as it gets or a revolutionary radical on the other side. Uh, but in context, in the context of education and intellectual uh, labor, uh, you can't really tell. Uh, and there's a distinction between teaching about uh, Richard Nixon and endorsing him. You know, uh, And I think that the first part of this has to do with general political statements and general political activities, and the other has to do with our scholarly endeavors around an issue that may be seen as political. Senator Duckworth. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Senator Putnam. I appreciate it. Just one final comment then, and <clears throat> I kind of anticipated that that was the purpose of that paragraph, and it makes sense to me. Uh, and the only reason I, I bring it up, and it talks about uh, does not interfere with the faculty member's job responsibilities as a faculty member. And so, you know, kind of as determined by who, and sometimes that can be a little bit subjective. All of that to say this, I think there, uh, I think preserving really what we're talking about is freedom of speech, academic um, uh, freedom, whatever you like, like the, the term to be, is extremely important. I think there's a lot of agreement there. But I also think, um, much as in society, there are some limitations or some reasonable consideration for to the extent at which that freedom um, is allowed is, war is warranted some consideration. And, and what I mean by that is, at what point does a college or a university have the ability to have that reasonable discussion or conversation with its faculty member to say, hey, perhaps a line has been crossed? What is that threshold? Uh, what is considered um, uh, interfering with the faculty member's job responsibilities as a faculty member? And I think Although we want to, of course, uh, fight for and preserve academic freedom and protections, I think it's incumbent upon us as a legislature to acknowledge that a balance must exist there and that an institution needs to be able to um, ensure reasonableness to the extent possible as it relates to that academic freedom and that freedom of speech. Uh, I think most people would agree that that is a reasonable uh, conversation to be had and I want to ensure that those colleges, universities, higher education institutions still have the ability to do that or exercise that should it be necessary, should they deem it necessary, if that makes sense. That's all I've got, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Senator Putnam, briefly, and then we'll get to Senator Rarick. I was nervous about asking you for permission to speak this time, so, so thanks for being nice this time. I, I, I just wanted to comment, um, just uh, to thank Senator Duckworth for the conversation, but also to say that I approach this conceptually in a different way, and to me this isn't exclusively or entirely or even primarily an issue of free speech. It's about respect for professional expertise. Um, and so, like, once that's the line right there, is are you behaving as a professional intellectual, as a scholar, as a teacher? And that's where the, and to me that line is actually fairly clear. Uh, and institutions currently have the capacity and the ability to police that line and nothing in this bill, I think, obviates it. That's, that's my personal perspective on it. Uh, Senator Rarick. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I might need to challenge uh, Senator Putnam to see that curriculum that would make people believe he's a right-wing conservative. <laughs> 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 Um, Take my class. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
So um, you mentioned that uh, this is actually in a uh, policy or the contract already. Is it the, the same language or is this just similar language that we're looking at? Um, what, what would? That's Senator a good question, Senator Renwick, if I may so phone a friend. <laughs> <laughs> um, Mr. Nega. Thank you, uh, Chair Fatah, um, Senator Rarick. Uh, MSCF and IFO have similar language in our contracts, but not exactly the same language around academic freedom, and this is a combination of that language uh, to preserve the intents of both contracts, so. Senator Rarick. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I guess one of my struggles that I've seen, um, things that I believe should be collectively bargained and, and worked at, uh, on levels between employers and employees are coming um, to the Capitol and coming through as state statute. Can you help me understand if this is in your contract, um, why do we need a need to ratify this in state statute? Mr. Nega. Yes, uh, Chair Fata, um, Senator Rarick, I, uh, as I stated earlier, what we're seeing is that the very legislate, legislator, legislatures that may be facing this kind of conversation in other states are making decisions to move into classrooms, essentially, and decide what curriculum is appropriate and what kind of curriculum is inappropriate. Um, Florida's law, for example, restricting um, general education courses from discussing certain topics, um, the restriction on faculty from being able to talk about certain parts of history in particular ways. Um, this, these are efforts that are actually happening in legislatures across the country. And Minnesota has an opportunity to say, Yes, we understand that the faculty have bargained for this in their contracts, but we also believe as a state that we should protect the academic freedom of the public faculty who work for our institutions, um, and that we have no intention of ever moving into those curricular decision-making roles as legislators. Sorry. Senator Rick. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I would uh, just... Uh, a response to that, I would say if I uh, am a far right uh, wing person who wants to do that and I believe I have the votes to do that, I'd have the votes to repeal this from state statute. So I, I don't see that this offers the protection that you're thinking it does. I think having it in your contracts is where it belongs um, and that's where it's appropriate. Um, and I guess if something like this is going to move forward, I, the comment that was made, you know, that this protects faculty and students, um, as Senator Duckworth mentioned earlier, I don't see that this protects students. And that I, I guess I would like to see that brought up too, that a, a student, um, if they're expressing their, I, mean, I love the fact that you're saying in your class you welcome that and you um, want that dialogue, but I don't think that happens in every class. And just like we're saying, um, what we heard in the testimony before, I think, you know, it's not ideal everywhere, and we're going to have those situations. And so I, I would like to see if we're going to move forward with something like this, that a, a student would also have a protection within a class that if they express um, political opinions or views, that they're not going to be, um, you know, a grade might suffer uh, because of that as well. So thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Rick, and thank you for admitting you're a lefty. <laughs> Senator Putnam. Uh, sorry. Mr. Nega. Chair Fata, Senator Rarick, I just wanted to respond quickly. Some of the faculty members in our union who are the most outspoken advocates of our academic freedom clauses in our contract are our most conservative faculty members because they know that if they were to be working in an environment that didn't have this sort of protection, that they would be at the whims of whoever might be running their university. And um, it, is, it is my most conservative colleagues who say that the most important part of being in a faculty union for them is what we provide them in terms of these protections about academic freedom. So this is not about trying to protect liberal faculty this is about protecting faculty who do the work of educating students and provide that diversity of opinion across our, our areas of expertise. Senator Rarick. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And um, I'm a union member myself, IBW 110, and that's a, I believe that's the 
the role of the union mm -hmm. to, to come together, the voices to come together, uh, so that you can stand for the, you know, what you are looking for, the rights that you want to work together and you stand together for that. So that's why I, I just believe that belongs in the collective bargaining um, arena and, and not coming to government and asking government to ratify it. It, it, sh it belongs in that uh, role of the employees working together um, to do that. that. That's what I believe the role of the union is and, and not the, the legislature. Thank you, Senator Rick. Uh, Senator Putnam, before we move on, any closing comments? Uh, thank you for Mr. the Chair. vigorous. <laughs> oh, sorry. Senator Umu Verbein. Thank you, Mr. I Chair. I just wanted to make sure Senator Putnam got to say his final comments, but I just had a comment and a question. Um, I think the discussion earlier was really important about just sort of like the toll this takes on faculty. I um, am the proud daughter of a retired public school teacher and just remember some of the tough like no child left behind years and like how hard that was on him and his colleagues. So really just the moving of the political winds um, and feeling that pressure of like an entire system coming down on you. I also love the faculty who was like, I will take you up on that and come to the state level and advocate for it. That is great. So glad you're here. Um, I just wanted to know, uh, I see the term political figures in the bill. If that comes out of the, if that's like language that was used in the contracts and how that would be, like what's the definition of that? Senator Putnam. Senator Weaver, can you uh, point to the line that, that that language is? Mr. Chair. Senator Weaver, um, yeah, I see it on 1.12, uh, and then again, 0.17. Political, so where, wherever it references political figures, board of trustees, donors, and other entities. Senator Putnam. I'm sorry, Mr. Chair, I'm still not seeing that language. Mr. Chair, good counsel. Version of the bill. Uh, Ms. White. Ms. White. Um, Mr. Chair and members, um, Senator Putnam, it is on 1.12. Um, that sentence says findings without inference from political figures, board of trustees, and then again on page one, line 17. That sentence says, courses the uh, faculty member is assigned to teach without interference from political figures, board of trustees, donors, and other entities. Okay. Thank you, Ms. White. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Ms. White, and thank you for the question, uh, Senator Umer Braden. Um, I'm, I'm thinking that means us. <laughs> Senator Uh Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just, I serve on Judiciary Committee, so we like to get in the details. Um, and I'm just curious if the, literally the term political figures, was that something that's used in the current contracts? Mr. Nega. And I, I, sorry, Mr. No, Chair. And I get what we're getting at. I just want to make sure we have like a good definition. So we know we're talking about us. <laughs> I think so. Mr. Nega. <laughs> Chair Fata, um, Senator Umova Brayton, I, I think so, is my official answer. Is John here? He is, but he's maybe texting me something. <laughs> <laughs> Senator Pundin, would you like to refer the bill to judiciary? <laughs> <laughs> we'll find out. We'll find out. <laughs> uh, Mr. Chair, I thought you were my friend. <laughs> Mr. Chair, Senator Umu Rabin. Can we just hear from Council on that? Ms. White. Uh, Mr. Chair and members, when a when a term isn't defined in the statute, you basically go to the dictionary. Um, and a political figure is a person who has political power in the government of the state, a person active in party politics or a person holding or seeking an elected office in government. Senator Omar Rabin. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Council. I, um, and I think I get where you're getting. I, I fully understand the intent of the bill. I would love to sign on. Um, I just want to make sure if there's specific people that you have been concerned about um, that we have a good definition of that that carries over as we look to codify what's in um, existing contracts. So, 
Let me know if I can help. <laughs> Thank you, Senator Umar Rabin. Uh, Senator Putnam, closing comments briefly, and then we'll lay the bill over. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair, for hearing the bill. Thanks much, uh, committee, for the vigorous and really fascinating conversation. Senate file 4416, as amended, is laid over. Thank you, Senator Putnam. Thank you. Next up is uh, Senate file 4597, Senator McEwen. We will be sending this bill over to state and local government committee. Yes. Sorry, Senator McEwen. It doesn't matter. Thank you. Can we make sure? Senator McEwen, welcome. Uh, we'll be sending this bill to state and local government committee as its next uh, stop. Welcome and uh, please, please proceed. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair and members. It is my great honor today to be here with this coalition to present to you Senate File 4597, the bill that was brought to me in my office by the workers you see in the audience and many more across the University of Minnesota system. This bill, members, is about fundamental labor rights. U of M workers should have the same rights to join our unions as anyone else. The Public Employment Labor Relations Act is supposed to guarantee the right to collective bargaining for Minnesota's public employees. However, as currently written, PELRA prevents over 23,000 faculty, staff, and student workers at the University of Minnesota from coming together with their coworkers to form unions. These workers simply want the same opportunities and protections as any other group of public employees in our state. Mandated bargaining units are the exception, not the norm. While some workers have found appropriate unions in their mandated units, over two-thirds of U of M workforce are trapped in units that make no sense. And I would reference um, that there are a couple of uh, professors' letters in your packets that should talk about some of that. Um, thousands of U of M employees are trapped in catch-all bargaining units that make unionization effectively impossible. For decades, these units have been packed with new hires who share little in common, and organized employees have been reclassified out of their unions and into these catch-alls. This has resulted in a massive concentration of workers into non-union jobs. Although only four of 13 mandated units are not organized, these four, the four of the 13, now hold about two-thirds of the U of M workforce. And I'm going to say that again so everybody can really take that in. Although only four of 13 mandated units set out in Pelra are not organized, only four of the 13, those four now hold about two-thirds of the U of M workforce. Nowhere else will you find such eclectic and head-scratching bargaining units, not in the public or the private sector. The committee has written testimony from experts in labor law and relations saying the same, and again, that should be in your packets. The Public Employees Labor Relations Act provides for rules and institutions for handling unit determination. They work perfectly well. It's time to use them to fix this mess. I ask respectfully that you join me in supporting these U of M workers who simply want the same right to form or join a union that other public employees have. Thank you. Thank you, Senator McEwen. Uh, we'll be asking our testifiers to keep their comments to two minutes or their testimonies to two minutes. Uh, first up, we have Heather Holcomb. Welcome. Please introduce yourself for the record and proceed. Yes. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, Mr. Chair and committee members. Thank you very much for the opportunity to testify in support of Senate File 4597. I think I've been waiting for this moment most of my life. Uh, my name is Heather Holcomb. 
I'm a lecturer in English and the vice president of the University of Minnesota chapter of the American Association of University Professors. I've been at the U for six years. Uh, in its current form, PELRA does active harm to thousands of workers at the U. I am one of them. I hold a PhD in my field and teach hundreds of students each year with distinction. Yet because of PELRA's mandated bargaining units, I am classified as staff rather than faculty, and my job is defined by precarity. I work on last minute, unstable, short-term contracts for unlivable pay. Last year, I earned $38,000 as a full-time instructor teaching three classes per term. For most of my time at the U, I have received no benefits of any kind. I am grateful for the stories of my colleagues at Minnesota State today. They are familiar because we experience the same things at the University of Minnesota. There are over 1,500 contingent faculty like me at the U, and we would like our basic right at Minnesota public, as, as Minnesota public employees to determine our own bargaining unit. PELRA currently denies U of M workers that right. Worse, it warehouses us in illogical and impossibly large groups that block our paths to unionization. To explain, I'd like to direct you to the document titled Bargaining Unit 11. This is available to the audience, and this is also in your packets. This is my bargaining unit, the result of the current statutory requirements under PELRA. You should look carefully. It is two-sided. You might need to squint. That is because Unit 11 consists of more than 5,600 workers in no fewer than 199 job categories. We gave you the simplified version. To have a union, I would need to organize thousands of HR, IT, marketing, research, and student services staff. I would also need to organize the director of athletics, who makes over $1 million a year. One group you won't find in Unit 11 are the tenure track faculty who teach down the hall from me. They are in Unit 8. We do the same work, yet we are prohibited from bargaining together. Units 11 and 12 are both bloated past the point of absurdity, even as union-represented units are whittled away through the manipulation of job codes. As was stated, PELRA leaves 23,000 U of M employees with no plausible path to unionization. These statutory bargaining units are anomalous, unnecessary, and unjust. They are out of step with peer institutions around the country. They are needless. PELRA already has rules for determining appropriate bargaining units. They deny labor rights to a vast and crucially important sector of public employees. They enable the exploitation of educators like me. And they constitute insurmountable barriers to unionization. The University of Minnesota workers are here today simply asking for the right to form common sense bargaining units that can lead to common sense unions should we choose to form them. Thank you sincerely truly for your time and consideration today. Thank you so much for your testimony, Ms. Holcomb. Uh, next up, we have Ian Riggenberg. Welcome. Reminder to testifiers to please keep your uh, testimonies to two minutes. Uh, please introduce yourself for the record and proceed. I'll do my best. Thank you, Mr. Thank Chair. You. Thank you, Senators. My name is Ian Ringenberg. I began working at the University of Minnesota in 2013 as an academic advisor. This job is what brought me to the state that I now call home. While I've been grateful to work with exceptional students and dedicated instructors for the past 11 years, I've found much that I wish to change about working conditions on campus. From staff working second jobs to supplement low salaries to insecure annual contracts that give employees no protection from unscrupulous supervisors. Seeking to improve this situation, in 2015, I found a group of other staff and faculty on campus who were organizing to address these and other concerns. We signed union cards with SEIU Local 284 and talked with our coworkers to do the same. And that's when I first had to learn about PELRA. 
You see, I'm a Unit 11 p &A employee, meaning under the current law, I can't organize only with workers doing similar administrative counseling and instructional work with students, but instead I have to organize with over 6,500 staff in comically different jobs spread out across five campuses. Under the current system, I'm categorized as a p and employee with head, coach, head football coach P.J. Fleck, but not with an entry-level advisor who may do nearly identical work to that, what I did. I believe that if we had been allowed to organize like workers in nearly any other workplace, public or private, we would have a union today. Since its creation in 1980, p and positions have grown from 6% of the university staff to over a quarter of all staff. And I should know, I served as the chair of the p and Staff Senate from 2018 to 2019. The bill before you addresses the absurdity of an employment group that has acted for 40 years as a catch-all for positions as diverse as IT professionals, optometrists, accountants, and athletic coaches, and would allow university staff to pursue organizing their, with their coworkers as I believe Pelra initially intended to make possible. I encourage your support of it. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much for your testimony, Mr. Regenberg. Next up, we have Caitlin McLean and then followed up by Shay Hornig. Welcome, please introduce yourself for the record and proceed. Thank you, Chair, committee members. My name is Dr. Caitlin McLean. I'm a physician training in both internal medicine and pediatrics at the University of Minnesota. I'm here representing the interests of res resident physicians. I'm hoping that you're familiar with who we are, either through popular television shows or from your personal interactions with the healthcare system. Simply put, we have terminal degrees. We are doctors and we're training to be specialists. I can honestly say that I love my job. It's a privilege. I'm here, we are here because fundamentally every day what we want is for Minnesota families to get the best care possible. You see, whether you know it or not, there are hundreds of resident physicians scattered throughout specialties and throughout hospitals around this state. If you were to name a large hospital off the top of your head right now, odds are I can likely point to a badge hanging in my kitchen that corresponds to that exact hospital. That's right, I personally have seven such badges. We, the people in this room, the people that I'm representing, are the doctors that you see when you come in an emergency room, when you are seen in an operating room, when you are admitted to hospital wards. We take care of you, of your family, of your constituents. We do that every minute of every day, of every week, of every year. We do that while you sleep, while you commute, while you debate. Over the last few days, I've been receiving messages from residents who are in the middle of long stretches and wish that they could be here. Residents who are parents who have had not had a weekend off in two months in a row and want to spend time with their children. I can honestly say that I see the best and the worst of humanity every single day at my job. My colleagues and I walk through fear, grief, joy, hope, and uncertainty with patients every single day, and it's our privilege to do so. However, we are our best in these moments when we have time, when we have rest. I'm not here to debate the finer points of our job or specific job protections. Um, we often push the boundaries of 80 hour work weeks. I know I've personally reported passing that mark more than one time in my short career. The reason we're here is that the appropriate way to dispute these conditions through collective bargaining is unattainable for us. The current collective bargaining units don't lend a voice for us to these people that work every hour of every day to care for the people of this state. We're your doctors and we need a voice. I urge your support on this bill. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony, Dr. McLean. Uh, next up we have Shay Hornig. And the last speaker would be, I apologize. And next up would be Sandra Sharrier. So welcome, Shay. Please introduce yourself for the record and proceed. Thank you, Chair, members of the committee. Uh, my name is Shay Horning, and once again, I'm the State Government Affairs Coordinator for the Undergraduate Student Government at the University of Minnesota. Um, I'm here today to speak in support of SF 4597, which would provide UMN workers with the same rights as other public employees. 
Aside from my position at USG, I am also a work-study recipient and was a student worker prior to taking on my current position in student government. While I enjoyed my job, compensation was a driving factor in my decision to leave. To put it bluntly, I don't know any student workers who feel fairly compensated for their work. Yet at the same time, Pellera loopholes place immense barriers in our ability to advocate for ourselves. Specifically, Pellera bars students from collective action if they're eligible for work study, which hurts students who already face financial barriers. Students instead have to turn to organizations like USG, who managed to increase student wages to $15 an hour in 2022, a fight that took over a decade and is still less than minimum wage in Minneapolis. While USG's purpose is to advocate on behalf of students, student workers should be allowed to advocate for themselves. Other post-secondary institutions have already acknowledged that students deserve to be treated the same as other workers, most notably at McAllister right here in St. Paul. The changes this bill would implement aren't radical. They simply affirm that student workers at the University of Minnesota won't be left behind as an increasing number of higher education institutions acknowledge that their students shouldn't be treated any differently. The bottom line is that student workers are still workers. Their status as a UMN employee should not bar them from enjoying the same rights as other public workers. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony. Next up, we have Sandra Sharier. Welcome, please introduce yourself for the record and proceed. Hello everyone, thank you for having me today. My name is Sandra Shariar and I am here today to speak in favor of SF4597. I am a third year PhD candidate in the Department of Biomedical Engineering at the U. I work in Dr. Chun Wong's lab working on biomaterials for drug delivery. At the University of Minnesota, graduate assistants are represented by UMN GLU, local 1105 of the United Electrical, Radio, and Machine Workers. When I was admitted to the PhD program, I was given a three-year College of Science and Engineering fellowship offered to incoming students of underrepresented backgrounds with outstanding qualifications. During the academic year, I am paid through this fellowship funding. Over the summer, I was paid through my lab as a research assistant. I am passionate about the important work that I do as a graduate fellow. Under the current Pellera statute, my work during the summer as a research assistant is considered a bargaining unit position represented by my union, GLUE UE Local 1105. However, my fellowship position over the academic year is not even considered by the university nor the law to be employment at all. During summer months, while I'm funded as a research assistant, I work on the development of polymeric biomaterials that can deliver medicines to biologic systems. My duties include polymer synthesis and characterization, equipment upkeep, waste disposal, management of harsh organic solvents, training new lab members, and supply ordering and restocking. It is exciting and innovative work. During the academic year, when I am funded through fellowship, I go into work every day in the same lab with the same supervisor conducting the exact same work duties. The only difference is that the university and PELRA do not consider this to be employment. I am outside of the bargaining unit and do not have access to the hard fought protections gained by our union. I lack recognized access to our grievance procedure. I can be made to take unpaid work training. There is little recourse if I am expected and told to work far above 40 hours per week. Thousands of other graduate students are in the same position that I am. We conduct research, teaching service, administrative responsibilities, the, much the same as other graduate assistants, but because of a technicality in PELRA, we lack collective bargaining rights. SF4597 would rectify this by explicitly recognizing fellows for what we are, graduate student workers employed by the university to further its research, teaching, and service mission. I ask you to join graduate assistants, undergraduate workers, staff, faculty, and unions across the state in supporting the passage of this bill. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony. Our next speaker will be uh, U of M President Jeff Edinger. Welcome, uh, please introduce yourself for the record and proceed. Thank you, Chair Fate and members of the committee. We appreciate the opportunity to be here today to speak on SF4597, a bill to modify the public employee definition and modify the University of Minnesota's employee bargaining units. We received a fiscal note request on this item less than a week ago on March 1st and only learned about this hearing two days ago. 
We are currently gathering data as well as studying the financial implications to the University of Minnesota to address the fiscal note and we'll also need to consider operational implications to the university. The potential impact of this bill on our five campuses also deserves the benefit of a shared governance conversation that involves the full university system. My responsibility, like any public steward, is to properly discuss this within the university community and conscientiously evaluate what this bill might mean for the future. I also do want to clarify for your committee and to the public that while the materials before you include a letter representing the individual opinions of three members of the university's Board of Regents, they would be the first to tell you that they are not speaking for the full board. So we just wanted to clarify that. The University of Minnesota is proud of the work that we do every day together with our union represented employees in many roles throughout our system. With the chair's permission, I'd like to ask Ken Horstman, our Vice President for Human Resources, to talk about some of the policies and initiatives related to our various employee groups. Thank you very much, President Edinger, for being here and for sharing your perspective. Mr. Horstman, if you would please state your full name for the record and commence your testimony when you're ready. Okay. Uh, thank you, Vice Chair Putnam. I'm Ken Horstman. Um, my role is the Vice President for Human Resources at the University of Minnesota. Thank you, uh, President Edinger, for being here today. Thank you, members of the committee, for this opportunity. Uh, we respect the comments made here today and understand that PELRA is a long-term act that, uh, you know, uh, is due for review. Um, our caution is that we, when we make changes, we wanna make changes that have the impact that we all hope to see for our employees. The university does support a positive and respectful work environment for all its employees, both unionized and non-unionized faculty, staff, and students. Whether through collective bargaining or our shared governance structure, we have multiple connections with all of our employees to regularly seek feedback on issues of importance to them, from employment to policy to new initiatives and much more. Faculty, staff, and student employment are governed by university policies and rules that do have protections, which are updated from time to time in close consultation and collaboration with each constituent group. And examples of this may be civil service rules, tenure code, P&A rules, and policies, the Office of Conflict Resolution Grievance Structure, the Senate Judicial Committee, and the University Senate Representation. A number of initiatives can be examples, and I'll try to be brief given the time frame here. Uh, over the last 10 years, we have had multiple projects in the uh, job family and comp compensation space to work on our employee job classifications, make sure they're accurate and appropriate, and that we simplify the number of job classifications and map them to uh, a new structure that allows us to improve equity and inclusion across our institution. Uh, we are also currently undergoing a market refinement project to help guide us on where we need to be more competitive with our salaries and benefits. This work on an annual basis, once refined, adjusts salary floors every year to keep up with market thereby raising employee salaries. We have also, as mentioned by a previous speaker, increased undergraduate student worker pay in September of 22 to $15 an hour. And we are continuing to look at indexing that in the future as we go forward. Uh, we have done uh, groundbreaking work in higher education around employee engagement for the past 10 years. We are the leading uh, university in the Big Ten on an employee engagement survey and the follow-up work and the Im impact it has on our environment. Because of that, we have seen a 10-point increase in the number of staff who say they work in an effective environment, and the portion of faculty who report the same has remained stable over the last decade. The number of engaged staff is at an all-time high as we measure that according to the survey, and we are particularly pleased with that given the incredible challenges all of us have had in the past four years. We also measure what we call frustration, meaning that employees have a high commitment and dedication to the university, uh, but they find the work environment ineffective, and that is at the lowest point we have had in our survey. We have also completed a campus climate survey to focus on the community and belonging, particularly for those in underrepresented employee groups, and we are taking that work seriously as well. Recently, in the past uh, year, 
the two years, our University Senate has come forward with a workforce reinvestment resolution focusing on 23 recommendations from faculty and staff and shared governance, mainly non-union roles about changes they wish to see in the workplace. And we are about to pro provide our response to the Senate in a plan of action that will uh, be discussed and agreed to going forward. We are committed to collective bargaining. As mentioned, we are in current negotiations with our new graduate assistant union. We are meeting with them four times a month. We have a leadership team that supports that bargaining effort. And we are well through the non-economic factors and now moving into the economic factors. At most institutions of higher ed, this first contract can take up to a year given the complexities of pay associated with graduate assistantships. We understand there may be some changes to the current PELRA definitions that make sense and will be beneficial to our employees and we're very open to discussing what those might be. Those discussions we feel include conversations with all of our employee groups, including those here today, but many others. And to move forward in a thoughtful and measured manner for what is best for both the university and of course for our employees. As uh, uh, interim president Edinger said, we are in the process of looking into what this bill will mean for the university, including the understanding what its fiscal impact might be. And we will be responding uh, very soon with more detail. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Vice President Horseman. Um, members do have questions or comments? Senator Umar Braden. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, President Edinger, did I hear you talk about wanting the decisions to be made by share, a shared governance structure? Can you tell me a little bit more about who's included in that? Uh, absolutely. Thank President you, Edinger. Chair. Thank you, Senator. Um, the decisions aren't, aren't made by the shared governance structure. It is a consultative structure whereby we gain input from the University Senate, which includes faculty, includes staff, includes students uh, from all five campuses. And so we would want to have the opportunity, as the shared governance model contemplates on many issues, to, to hear their input. Senator Weaver Braden. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, President. Um, that's helpful to know, and I'm um, glad to hear that a big part of that is faculty. I think I would just say that I feel like workers are the main ones who need to make the decision about whether or not they need a union. Um, and thank you to the workers who are here today. Um, I, I just feel like that is, that's their decision to make. Um, they should be allowed to make that decision. Uh, Senator Rarick, then Senator Murphy, then Senator Duckworth. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and um, you know, a couple of comments. Uh, you know, I know this is uh, something that the U especially hasn't had a lot of time to see this language. You know, I'm hoping as I'm digging through it, I'm seeing some things that I'm hoping we're willing to work on. I think, you know, we're hearing uh, loud and clear that uh, a reorganization has to happen. Uh, but like one of the concerns I have as a union member myself um, around the part that's being struck um, for the student workers, um, line 1.20 on to the second page. I guess a concern that I have there is these jobs are for the students kind of like a financial aid. And I, as a union member, I, I don't want to see uh, our students ending up paying union dues. They may end up getting, you know, a higher wage. I want, I do want them to be able to voice together but I think I want to be careful with that, um, you know, if there's a way that they can be represented. But I don't want to see those students using what is basically financial aid um, to end up having to pay union dues. I don't think that's the point of those jobs. So um, I think there are some discussions that we should be, you know, having. Um, and I think this bill uh, has probably really kick-started uh, those discussions. But I hope uh, we're not going to just ram something through, like I said, some of that... Um, Hopefully, we'll uh, have more discussions. We can see some tweaks. Um, again, I don't want to see unintended consequences that uh, maybe in the end, especially some of our students, uh, might financially actually just go backwards. So um, like I said, as a union member myself, I want to see people be able to be represented. I believe in collective bargaining, um, but I also want to make sure it's uh, not going to harm somebody as well, especially our students. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Eric. Senator Murphy. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, and uh, thank you, uh, Chair Fateh and Senator McEwen uh, in your absentia uh, for bringing this proposal. Uh, but more importantly, I think I am struck by the people who are here uh, behind you. Um, and as a person who grew up in a, in a labor family, my dad was a UAW member building cars. I worked in a grocery store when I was in college. That was my first union job. Um, I worked for a union. So I, I feel like labor has been a part of contextually of my life. But there is uh, uh, organizing anew in new sectors of work. Uh, I think especially as the economy has shifted away from traditional workforce um, to more, uh, as we say, the gig economy, more independent contractors where, or where more employers are um, limiting, as we heard perhaps earlier with the contingent faculty, um, the ability for somebody to work in a full-time position um, to manage perhaps budgets at the expense of what we usually think about um, as what we earn in our workplace. And, and I say that as a general comment, not a general, not a statement about the University of Minnesota itself. But as I look at the room behind us um, and the people who are saying we're interested um, in a change to power us so we have the opportunity to, to bargain collectively, I think about uh, a sports team, a college sports team saying we want to organize for purposes of collective bargaining. Um, what we're seeing, I think, is a response to the change in work for people. Um, and work, we know, is not only something we choose because we like our work. If we're lucky, it's a gift to love our work. But also that it is the means to support ourselves and our families. Um, and so I, I am, I think, mostly speaking to uh, the importance of this moment um, and recognizing the importance of this moment. And yes, uh, this is just the first hearing. And I'm sure there are at least two more hearings, if not more beyond that, on this important topic. But I'm really grateful that we're opening up the conversation um, because we do want the people who are working in Minnesota uh, to earn a decent living, to have dignity in work. Um, and I think it's one of the important ways that we retain people, um, especially young people who are coming to school here and wanting to stay in Minnesota. So while I get it's complex, I do think it's it's important that we're asking the question and, and studying it. So I really appreciate the approach from the U um, as you come to the table here um, and to the people who are behind you. There's a lot of them, um, you know, for your voices and helping to shape this policy. Thank you, Senator Murphy. Senator Duckworth. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll try to be as quick as possible uh, given the time. So uh, I've heard a fiscal note referenced. I'm, I'm assuming based on the conversation so far that we have no idea what, what what the fiscal note is, or is there one, or do we have any idea what, what dollar amounts might be attached to something like this? Uh, Mr. Olofsson? Uh, Mr. Chair, Senator Duckworth, the fiscal note has been requested, but it has not been completed yet. Okay. Senator Duckworth. Uh, thank you. Would it be fair to say uh, it has a likelihood to be fairly substantial? Uh, President Edinger, do you feel comfortable speculating on that, or? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator. No, I really probably wouldn't be. I would tell you, however, that we the, the deadline that we've received for the fiscal note is March 18th, and we do believe we'll be able to at least pre reply preliminarily on that by that time frame. All right. I appreciate that. If I can, Mr. Chair. Senator Duckworth, if I may, we might have someone else who can answer this. Is oh, Ms. Sure. Ms. Luger here? Ms. Luger? Ms. Luger? I'll go back if you would please, Ms. Luger, state your full name for the record and um, provide any wisdom and insight that you're able to offer, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. My name is Meg Luger Nikolai. I am an attorney with Education Minnesota. We are in partnership with AAUP, who shares an affiliate in the American Federation of Teachers, and we're also here with our faculty who represent, uh, who represent faculty members at MSCF as well as UEA. And I think as to the question of fiscal note, my primary expertise would probably be as a former employee of the University of Minnesota, as a college student a long time ago. And just to say that, you know, from our perspective, 
as representatives who work with UEA, the University of Minnesota has a fairly sophisticated HR system, and this would at most represent a marginal increase in the actual bargaining work because of a number of features of the bill, including, for example, language that is on line 5.23, which permits joint bargaining. Mr. Chair, if I may address Senator Rarick's question. Um, Certainly, sir. Okay, just to be clear, as I often am when I talk about PELRA, in the public sector, union membership is entirely voluntary. So no one would ever have to compulsorily pay dues to a union. And work study is not that different from union apprenticeship programs in which you earn while you learn. And so this would really not be super different from what occurs in the private sector as well. Thank you for your insight, Ms. Luger. I'm thinking in terms of um, insight specifically to Senator Duckworth's question, um, and not to inspire a chair war, uh, but Mr. Horseman, do you have a perspective on this as well? <laughs> You're welcome, President Editor. <laughs> Thank you, Interim President Edinger. Um, I, I respect the remarks from my UEA colleague. I do think um, the, the answer, the honest answer right now is it depends. Uh, there are universities that have significantly higher amounts of uh, union relationships than we do. We have 11 union contracts. If we get into subgroups with their own contracts, and even given joint bargaining, we have a very lean labor relations team. So internally, I think the resources would need to be redefined gradually over time, which could add to um, the employment expense. Uh, there may be other efficiencies that, that are nominal. Um, Thank you, uh, Mr. President. Senator Duckworth. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I appreciate it. Thanks for the uh, insights from those that provided them. Um, we'll stay tuned, I guess, to see kind of what some of the estimates come back at. I think the bill um, goes a little bit further than just trying to sort out or organize some units, which I can understand some frustration as it relates to that. Um, and specifically, I would have a question about uh, lines 5.25 and 5.26. They say this, and the commissioner must place special weight on the desires of the petitioning employee representatives. I'm just curious what, what that means, if anybody can weigh in on what that verbiage being added to state statute means and what its potential impact is to the entire process we're kind of talking about today. Senator Fate? Yeah, I'll phone a friend to Ms. Luger. Um, Mr. Chair. Senator Duckworth, I appreciate that question. That language is actually substantially similar to language that already exists in Section 179A.09, Subdivision 1. The very last sentence says, the commissioner shall place particular importance upon the history and extent of organization and the desires of the petitioning employee representatives. So that actually just recodifies language that, that exists in, the, in PELRA and has for a long time. So would you do me, a, if I may, Mr. Chair, Senator, do me a favor and maybe say that again a little bit slower because I think what I heard you say was something to do with importance and what I'm reading here says special weight. Um, and I think that depending upon the phrase you read and the phrase I'm reading right here, the interpretations or the meaning of those words could be very substantially different from one another. Ms. Luger, can I go So you would like me to slow down? Just that portion, please. <laughs> I had a cup of coffee. I apologize. Um, the I appreciate the that the language does appear different. I would say that Black's Law Dictionary defines substantial as without material qualification, and I think those two phrases are substantially similar. So, uh, if I may, Mr. Chair, Senator Duckworth, what is the what is the purpose of that language? If, if we're saying the commission must place special weight on the desires of a, pe a petitioning employee representative, in, in practical terms, what does that mean, or what does that translate into? In both the existing language of PELRA and the intent of this language is to ensure that the self-determination rights of the employees who are seeking a new bargaining unit is respected, among the other criteria that are listed in subdivision one, which is incorporated by reference in the new language. Okay. At line, well, it's in there somewhere. Yep, line 5.24. Sure, thank you. The, the, Mr. Chair, if I made the last comment I would make uh, has to do with the subdivision three on the very last page, the added language as it pertains to joint bargaining. I'm somewhat newer to the Higher Education Committee. I had the pleasure of being here last year. This is my second year, so I'm still learning. Uh, but one lesson I learned pretty quickly, or one thing I was told uh, pretty early and sometimes often, 
is that really the role of the legislature as it relates to the University of Minnesota or the Board of Regents is to simply listen to uh, input and feedback as it pertains to a budget and pass one, and that anything else uh, is left to the autonomy of the Board of Regents and how they govern their university, et cetera. And so I get a little bit concerned that the legislature um, uh, begins to cross the line or tiptoe over into the uh, administrative autonomy of the university when we start looking at language like that and interfering with or uh, dictating how they're going to potentially negotiate or bargain with their employees or faculty or what have you. So that's the only other thing I, I have us all uh, consider as it, as it relates to uh, this new added language that would be put in state statute. At the end of the day, we want folks to be able to, to bargain, to ask for fair wages, advocate for fair wages, be treated great, and have a phenomenal environment that they're working in. Uh, but we have to also acknowledge the fact that there are uh, fiscal and financial constraints that folks uh, have to work within, uh, and that uh, at, the, at the end of the day, um, there are respective roles, the legislature, the Board of Regents, the university, uh, and that any time the legislature places their hand on that very delicate scale of balance and pushes it down in favor of one party or one direction over to the other, it has very significant consequences and ramifications, or it could. And so we have to be very, very careful and purposeful about how we approach that and, and what's reflected in state statute and always be mindful of the role that we play in that process. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Douglas. Senator Rarick. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I need to make a quick response. Um, a difference that I would see between, you brought up the apprenticeship, and I think just everybody in the room that's here today, except for the one student, and why I am identifying the students separately, an apprentice is getting into a career and they're going to be in that union for their lifetime. A lot of the folks here in this room, this is their career. They're going to be in that bargaining unit for their lifetime, or their career time where these students are here for three, at tops, four years, and that's where I'm wanting to make sure we're looking at them a little bit differently because this isn't an investment for them and a career option. It is student aid is ultimately what they're getting, and that's why I'm pointing out that they should be looked at and treated a little bit differently. I, I again, believe they should be able to work together, but I struggle with the idea that um, we would collect union dues from them and then potentially that's taking away from the student aid that they're going to get. I would hope we could find a way to allow them to um, work together uh, without having to treat them like folks who are doing this as a, a group in their career area. That was I, what I see as a little difference. Members, any other uh, questions, comments for our testifiers? All right, uh, Senator Fate, would you like to move your bill? Yes. Senator Fate um, uh, moves that uh, Senate File 4597 uh, be passed and referred to the Committee on State and Local Government. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Senate File 4597 has been passed and referred to the Committee on State and Local Government. Uh, there being no further business before the committee, uh, the committee is now in re is adjourned. Thank you.